Good morning. Uh, um, Ephraim Mwamanya, now we have been listening to Cellulos, but I think we we'll talk more about starch now, uh, because cassava is basically starch. Uh, so we are not going to talk about a lot of wood, but we also have cellulose in there, especially the stem. And I think from your ideas, we can borrow a lot and then we can use it also still. So <coughs> uh, my topic is more difficult because talking about the whole of Africa when you are from Uganda <laughs> is quite a mouthful. But I'm going to try and give a picture of uh, what is happening in the cassava sector and where we can have interventions, especially for Africa, in creating such a bioresource uh, or harnessing it to help the people around there. So uh, what we know is that uh, most of the African economies, and I like uh, Western economies, depend on agriculture. And uh, we have a lot of things going on, especially in the products, which support this kind of uh, the agriculture dependent economies, that uh, especially the food products. And now uh, we have challenges now coming up with environment, because we have a lot of land being swallowed up with by agriculture. Uh, where we, because we, we are trying to catch up with the production levels. And the, at the end of the day, we have this kind of an competitive uh, activities going on, uh, where agriculture is coming in, but the production uh, is not, the productivity is not increasing as such. So we, we think there is a need to diversify from what has been going on, and, and we look at how we can uh, use agriculture sustainably, uh, to improve the economic uh, levels. So uh, we are thinking about uh, agriculture for chemicals, and I think that is what I'm here to discuss. How can we move, for example, what we are doing in agriculture towards a chemical-based uh, industrial model, and how we can tap into agriculture to make sure that these people who are engaged in, which is almost 70% uh, of the population, get to benefit. So w we can use the agriculture support sectors uh, in, in addition to available technologies so that we can go into what we call value-added uh, manufacturing and uh, using the biotechnology sectors so that we can get uh, to drive the bioeconomy. So apparently, uh, for cassava, I'm going to talk about cassava now, uh, we grow it almost everywhere in Africa. And uh, since we are running an informal pseudo bioeconomy already, because we are depending on this agriculture, uh, we can use cassava, which is basically almost everywhere in Africa, a big chunk of sub Saharan Africa, and uh, even now in South Africa, uh, so that we can run this, we can do something better uh, with, uh, with the agriculture and the economy. So we need to harness the potential it has in the different ways so as we to, to get the money out of it. And now, uh, why, why cassava? One of the things that we know is that uh, we already have proven and scalable bioprocesses and systems that are available for the utilization of cassava at the moment. There is a lot that has been done around cassava that we can tap in to improve and increase the ability of this crop uh, to drive the economy. Then we also have, uh, we also know that cassava is adaptable to bioprocessing. Uh, uh, the guy who was uh, presenting could, could see that trees can be adapted to bioprocessing. And so it's easy to uh, work with, for example, starch than cereals. I'm sure about that. Now, that means uh, if we can tap it to cassava, we can have more and more coming out. If they can do it in the wood, and the cereals, we can also do it for cassava, uh, which is potentially a starchy crop. Now, the economic feasibility of the processes also has been proved, and there is a lot of work being done uh, that ha had already been done on that. Uh, but specifically for food based and the biofuels, where uh, we think there is a lot of potential uh, to, to do this. So we have already seen that you can use the whole cassava plant to come up with a number of things. And then uh, uh, cassava starch and starch processing wastes. Uh, he said they are no longer called wastes, but we can 
actually tap this because they have a significant potential and they have industrial value. So that is why we, we are saying cassava could be key. Now, uh, for Africa, cassava is really a big thing. And, and uh, from those countries, you can see that almost a number of countries grow cassava, but th there are some major producers, of which Uganda is among. And uh, what we are saying is that uh, in most countries, actually the area under cultivation is very big, especially in Nigeria, DRC, and uh, Angola. And um, uh, of course, the production is not all that good, but uh, on, on, a, on, on, on a particular scale, when you look at the ratios or the tonnage, or the, the, the tonnage per hectare, or what we can get from each hectare, we can see that a number of countries are performing averagely. Now, all we need is to uh, improve this, because if we improve this, we can get up, for example, 19 tons per hectare, uh, and, and this could actually get into helping us to move from what is actually happening now to something that we need to move to, uh, which is uh, using cassava as a bioresource. Now, <coughs> when we look at uh, cassava, I don't know what is happening in this slide. Sorry. Something is missing there. But anyway, what I was trying to compare here is uh, how we can have cassava, which is being widely grown in Africa, small tonnage, but uh, we can improve it to meet the demand that we need, especially if about 32 to 35 of the total countries in Africa are growing it and uh, using it for different purposes. So other properties that we can tap into is that uh, cassava has a high rate of carbon dioxide fixation and uh, sugar synthesis, because we know this. Uh, when, when you put cassava down there, you are going to get a lot of uh, the carbon being fixed, and you have a lot of carbohydrates coming out of this. And then uh, in addition, uh, we, we already know that it can be manipulated for higher yields, and uh, we can do transgenesis and so many other things so that we can get uh, the potential coming out. Then we also have uh, the fact that most of the farmers know what to do with cassava. And like other crops uh, in, in Africa, uh, each and every farmer can go out there and plant cassava. You don't need to go to school to plant cassava. All you need is to know how to put it in the ground and, and go about it. So that means uh, you can capture a whole big part of the, the, the population to get into this. And since most of them are farmers, they can uh, actually benefit from it. Then cassava can tolerate a number of abiotic conditions that we are more likely uh, scared of, especially when it comes to drought, salinity, heat, and, and so many other things. It has been proved to be tolerant to most of these, and I like the, the mo most cereal crops. Now, we also know that it has raw water and fertilizer requirements. And in fact, we don't fertilize uh, cassava. We just grow it out there, and, and it does well, uh, quite well, for sure. Then it is also resistant to plant pathogens. Minimal effects have been observed. Of course, we have problems with viruses uh, and uh, some bacteria, but it is not as bad. We can still get something out of that. And then it has a high biomass output. Uh, if you look at the whole plant, the leaves, the stem, and the roots per se, we have a significant <coughs> amount of biomass that we can produce and we can utilize in that case. So if you, if you look closely at it, you realize that we have uh, a lot of carbohydrates uh, for cassava. And, and uh, that means we can utilize all this in a number of things that are carbohydrate related a number of uh, uses. And then we have less of the protein and the lipid and ash. So that working with it is quite easy, especially when you go into the bioprocessing bit. Uh, you can easily utilize cassava uh, without uh, putting in a lot of energy compared to when you utilize, for example, uh, the potato and the sweet potato, which uh, have significant amount of protein, significant amount of uh, lipid, and, and then you have to deal with all these things. In, in one case, yeah. Where is the major mass? Is it in the roots or is it in stem? Uh, the major mass, I think it depends on what you're talking about. We have a lot of starch in the roots. Mm -hmm. So we have starch being stored in the roots. We have a lot of uh, cellulose and other materials related to that in the stem. 
the leaves are basically, they don't have a lot of biomass, but they have cereals and other things. So we have uh, significant amounts of biomass in the whole plant. But majorly, depending on what you're interested in, if you're interested in the starch, then you go for the roots uh, and, and maybe the peels. And then if you're interested in the cereals and, and other things, in the whatever. But if you weigh the, the amount that is above the... the, the above ground is usually higher than below ground, yeah, depending on, even depending on the growing uh, season and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, we, we, we see a lot of things happening. So uh, I've shown this before, but this is where, for example, cassava is now, but we, we, we project that there will be more uh, cassava moving into uh, other areas apart from that, and the intensity of the growing will also increase compared to what has been there so far, especially in the southern parts of the country where we see a lot of uh, interest in this crop. And uh, of course, in the central and the uh, parts and the western parts, it has always been cassava there. So it's just a matter of uh, adapting it and using it for that purpose. Now, uh, when it comes to what it can do, and the, I think this is where the interest is, we have a lot of things, so many things, and, and we, we can use either starch, or we can use uh, the derivatives of starch, or we can use whole plants to do so many things, ranging from food uh, to pharmaceuticals, adhesives, and other things. So if one is to get into this crop and, and use it, you can go into whatever you want to do with it and, and you surely get there. So that is why it is so significant for Africa uh, to use this crop uh, to drive the economy, for example. And, uh, and for example, Uganda is using this as, as part of the, of the plans to, to, to do more uh, in, in, in agriculture. And, and they are moving into uh, not only biofuels and, and whatever, but they are also looking into biodegradable plastics reducing the, the plastic load uh, using these plastic containers. Uh, we are moving into uh, textiles, sizing and, pr and printing, and then uh, we're also going into uh, the, the, the prywoods and the sugar substitutes as part of very addition for cassava. So these things are being done on a small scale, and uh, most of them are on the cottage level. We don't have these big industries uh, doing this, but we have small, small people doing this and that. But we can aggregate this and, and make it bigger with time so that it can uh, move the whole economy forward. Now, uh, we, as I was saying, we can use the whole plant. So we can use the leaves, which are high in protein, and the also in the vitamins for food supplements and other things. So we can utilize the leaves too. Uh, we can utilize the stem. Yes, it is seed, uh, planting material, but we can use it for ethanol. And we have already done some work on this. And farmers, some people are using it. We crush it, use uh, the, 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 the cellulosic material for ethanol. And then we can use the root for so many things, but specifically by u extracting starch out of it and using this starch for a wide range of activities and money generating ventures. So basically the plant uh, is big. However, we, we still have a problem. So we, we need to uh, go into understanding what this is plant is all about, especially when it comes to identification of, of uh, uh, what actually it can do and how we can improve it. There are so many things we have not yet done. Yes, we are growing the cassava out there, but we don't know specifically if, for example, we can use specific varieties for specific functions. So bioprospecting, uh, characterizations, and a whole sort of stuff. Then in terms of production, we still have issues with yield. Uh, there are yield gaps. You find when you can, some varieties really yield low, others uh, completely don't do very well. And then we have costs uh, related to production and other things, because if you are, uh, you are engaging farmers to do this for you, uh, since we don't have uh, standard own industries and people doing this, then you have issues with the cost of the material that you are going to use as a bioresource, uh, which may get into uh, what you are going to get uh, as, as an investor or something like that. Then consistency in supply and other things, sustainability issues, and this comes in with uh, food sovereignty and, and food security, because this is a food crop that we are putting out there to, to be used as an industrial crop, and, and we are uh, putting out there for so many things, fuel, 
food, feed, even fiber. So you find that uh, you're going to have a lot of conflict there. So things have to be uh, really smoothed out so that people can uh, easily be comfortable with using it for the so many things we may need to use it for. Then uh, resource management itself, uh, we need to manage it in a way that uh, we can easily uh, uh, benefit from it. If we don't do it in a better way, we may end up in a problem. And then the genetics uh, of this crop. So, so many things are coming in, diseases and so many other things, and uh, we need to enhance or exploit the crop the way it is so that we can get a lot from it. And the processing uh, of this plant, we, we have a number of things that have to be done, but we don't have the skills. Now, that is where the problem is. You, you can have, you know what to do, but you don't have the skills, neither do you have, for example, the equipment and other things that can be used to utilize it, especially extraction, separations, the conversions for the starches, mm. the purifications and the refinings, until when you get uh, those so many products I was talking about. And then finally, the utilization. Uh, the problem with cassava f in Africa is that people take it to be a poor man's crop. So even products from it are taken to be for poor people. So at the, at the end of the day, this misconception about the, even the products coming from it will still be there. So we need to move a rock away from that kind of perception and get people to understand that actually you can use cassava for many other things. So ideally, uh, if we can do that, then uh, we, can move, uh, we can move on. So this is what we think can be done. I know there are so many concepts and so many other things that can be uh, put forward for the utilization of cassava <coughs> as a bioresource. But we are thinking of uh, using both starch and, and the lignocellulosic materials. We put them through uh, a treatment process convert them around, we can use biofactories, we can use so many other things, and we get a number of products, uh, especially on the chemical side, which can be used in the various applications that we have put forward. So uh, we can have this going on by maybe one company, or we can have this being done by a number of people. You have products at different sequences, which can be picked over and utilized. It, it's all about making sure that we complete the whole value chain and, and we get what we need out of it. So we also knew, know that we need a specific strategy. We need uh, the policy people to get in here and, and support the whole thing that we are trying to do. And, and we also need R&D initiatives for, for this kind of, of thing that we think we can do. But importantly, uh, there, there are potential research areas that need to be addressed so that we can uh, improve uh, even on the existing research efforts and come up with what we need uh, at the end of the day. So uh, it has to be policy and research uh, coming together and then we move what we are doing forward because what we have realized that most likely the research has a strong whatever in, in the, in the, in within what they are doing, but the policy is not there and, and that is what is happening, for example, with the GMO cassava that is being pushed out there for disease resistance. Mm -hmm. We have the research going on, we have the products, but we can't push them out there because Uganda does not have a registration uh, for the use of GM oil. So it's kind of, uh, you're doing something, it is there, but uh, it can't get off the, the shelf and go to the farmers. Uh, then the sustainability issues, as we said, there is that competition between the food, the feed, and, and so many other things. So we need to, to look at, uh, understand specifically what effect will ha uh, these interventions have on land and water viability. Because we are, we are, we are talking about uh, making this thing big and huge, but this will have issues, especially uh, with land, where uh, land is a problem in Africa, and especially in Uganda where I come from. We also need to see that there are no negative interactions between uh, the intervention we are talking about and the existing economies, because there must be something that is being done. So what is it that we are going to do that will not affect what is being done, uh, but almost improve on it? So we need to look at that. Then a comprehensive sustainability plan is needed uh, for, for, for this, especially for Africa. We, we cannot just put it there and say farmers grow cassava 
what about other things? Because there is a tendency in agriculture that when something is profitable, everybody wants to go into it. And then you leave out some other things. And, and that would be a very big problem, especially for the orphan crops, which seem to serve uh, a, a greater part of Africa with nutrients and other things. So as, as we try to tell people, okay, cassava is good, cassava can do much, what about other things? Then uh, uh, issues of eco-efficiency and the uh, decentralized and local <coughs> systems that need to be used uh, because the models that have been seen to work is that the cottage models uh, where the farmers get involved seem to work better than where you have these big farms coming in and, and, and doing the thing because uh, we have most of the people into that sector, agriculture, so you need to make sure that they are involved and that has to be at a cottage level. If you don't do that, uh, we suspect there would be a problem uh, there. And then we can also use the already existing models to come out with uh, what can be done uh, better. So <coughs> the number of challenges that uh, this one may come with, investment risks, uh, a, a number of them, uh, inability to attract a, a relevant human resource, uh, where we, we don't have people, we may have people not uh, so interested in this. Uh, we, we have uh, some things that happen out there in Africa where you find that people may be interested, for example, in only banana, and, 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 and uh, getting them interested in cassava would be a problem. So, yeah, that would be a challenge. Then technology and then uh, the sustainability and and the environment. But we also have agricultural pests and diseases. Uh, we have seen, for example, cassava brown streak disease having those very detrimental effects on production. Uh, for Uganda, for example, production has reduced significantly, yet the land area being uh, farmed is bigger. The same with Kenya, Tanzania, uh, the whole of East Africa where this disease is. Uh, and, and it is spreading uh, towards West Africa, so that means we may have a whole big problem there. Then uh, post-harvest management practices, cassava is very perishable. So dealing with the root may be a problem. You may lose a lot of it if you don't have something like that uh, coming up. Then uh, uh, we don't see appropriate technologies being used widely, especially in uh, the crop sectors. Uh, we have a tendency to use the traditional technologies, which in most cases are not as appropriate as possible. And then uh, this has been talked about. We have the linkages between uh, the different sectors that are involved in uh, this uh, kind of thing, and, and other things that uh, we can we'll discuss more. So uh, I was asked, how can uh, Sweden help? And <coughs> one of the things uh, we think could be important is to improve the technical competence of the existing institutions and, and, and the systems. Uh, because we can have more, especially on the policy and, 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 and the bridging between the policy and the research. We need to have that in place. And then the institutions also have to be given competence, especially in breeding, so that we come up with speciality, maybe special cassava uh, traits. Uh, for example, we can have a cassava which only produces tubers. Uh, you have this whole thing. Uh, becoming big enough so you have more starch uh, being produced for that purpose. And then uh, we need uh, product production processes and marketing, uh, technology developments and improvements on the available technologies. Yes, there are some technologies being used, but they need to be uh, pushed up so that they can do what they're supposed to do. Uh, the linkages, market and communication strategies uh, is still a problem. People here are doing this same person is doing it somewhere in Africa, but they don't know they are doing the same thing. They are working on the same crop, addressing the same problem, and, and they cannot come together to, to do this together and then, then uh, come up with. Then specifically trade development for industrial value because we are talking about a, a chemical industry. So if we can have a plant producing more sugar and then you just put it, instead of hydrolyzing it in a biothermal plant, you just ferment it. Uh, we are thinking of those weird things, uh, weird ideas like that. And then fine-tuning uh, the industrial process and the bioproducts development that has to come from this. So I think that is all. Thank you. <coughs>